welcome everybody in uh, our weekly seminar. Today we have a pleasure to have uh, Walter Gardas from uh, Institute for Theoretical and Applied Informatics uh, in, in Gliwice, our like uh, friendly institution from uh, from the Team Net Grant. So Bartek is a expert on many body physics, quantum computers, and uh, uh, quantum annealing in particular. Uh, he did his PhD in University of Silesia, I believe. Yeah. Then uh, yep. you got a, a Fuga grant, so so you were like independent postdoc in uh, Jagiellonia University. Uh, after uh, after the the US. So be, before the US. that, okay, I actually. Sorry. Yes. Okay, and before after okay, the so then before that you went to where was that? Like so you. Uh, Okay, no, I, I work with Wojtek Zurek in. Wojtek Zurek in uh, yes. I forgot where he yeah. works actually. Is it? Los Alamos National Lab. Los Alamos, in Mexico. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so I, I spent two years there and then I, I moved to uh, to Krakow for, for, uh, to realize. Okay, Fuga. this part I sorry, I, I confused it. And then uh, Bartek is, uh, is working as a postdoc, I believe, uh, in, in, in a group in Gliwice now. Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, so, 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 so today he will be telling us about classical simulation of a uh, quantum annealing machine, as far as I understand. Yeah. So Very actually, I'm going to be talking about, so actually, I'm going to be uh, talking about quantum simulation using quantum annealers. So we, we're going to, we, we, I'm going to be talking about something quite reverse. Okay. Okay. <laughs> My... Okay. Okay. So, so it's all the same is on me. Please. But, I, I know. Okay, uh, thank you. So first of all, uh, many thanks for for the invitation. Uh, this is my uh, I, I guess uh, I, I've never been this in, in this room before, so I'm, I'm happy. Um, and uh, like I mentioned, I'm, I'm going to be talking about parent time dynamics with with, with uh, quantum annealers, which means that we're going to be doing a real experiment using quantum computers. It's going to be uh, simulation using quantum classical simulation. Those are not quantum simulation. Those are not classical simulation, but quantum simulation actually. So the, the, the quantum annealer are going to do the, 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 the computing. Okay. So uh, let me just acknowledge collaboration. Uh, the work was done. Uh, most of the work was actually done by Kondrat Wojewicki and and, and uh, Andrzej Winskowski, uh, who are uh, a PhD student of mine and was uh, collaborated with, with Piotr Gavron, uh, who is uh, here today. Um, well, so before I start, let me just give you the usual motivation why you should do, do quantum computing. And when people tell, uh, ask me why should I get involved with, with quantum adiabatic computation, I usually uh, tell them that first of all, you you have uh, growing hardware software, and this is this is important, right? Because only at uh, ten years ago or so, everything was just theoretical. You couldn't do any experiments, and you know, in physics and 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 a different in computer science and physics experiments matter, right? At the, at the, at the end, so uh, right now we are we are actually observing this growing hardware hardware support, right? And uh, only two days ago, D-Wave actually announced the, the newest generation of, of quantum annealers that has uh, 5,000 qubits. So we are really living in uh, extraordinary times in that respect. So second, second sort of big reason is that um, we have big players involved like IBM, Microsoft, Google. So for young people, this is actually a good idea to enter this field because of, you know, science is interesting, but also money is good, right? So that would be like a, a egoistic uh, motivation to, to, uh, to start doing some quantum stuff, especially on quantum computers, right? And something which is equally important, I would say is that access is fairly easy to get, right? Um, you can get limited amount of, of access of computational time. You can get basically for free, uh, but even if you have to pay for it, it's not that expensive. One computational hour uh, on D-Wave, for example, cost uh, $1,500. So it's, it's, not, it's not much. And you can do a really, a really match uh, with, them without, with this one hour. So that would be like um, the motivation. So, not many people know actually that idea of quantum computation dates back to uh, early 60s, right? So the idea that, well, uh, Feynman, is, Feynman is behind uh, was fully developed in 60s. That's the, 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 the idea alone. So uh, sort of it's been 16 years ago. 
So I, I guess it, it's fair to ask uh, how far along on that path are we right now? So can we actually use quantum computers, the, the quantum computers we have right now, to simulate some physical processes? And so that's, that's the motivation behind this work. So usually, uh, especially younger people that entered the field a couple of years ago, has, uh, have, this, uh, have this idea that quantum computers are for uh, optimization problems, not the case. So the idea was first, uh, first, first realized to simulate physics. So we wanted to have quantum computers to be able to simulate physical systems. That's the true motivation. Optimization problems are just like uh, byproducts. I would, I would say so. So again, it's it's fair to ask. Well, if we want to have two quantum computer, a quantum computer to simulate physics, can we do some physical simulation right now? Um, so just to, to give you a flavor, what is actually possible? Um, I can say I can say at least that quantum computers, current quantum computers, can assist uh, classical simulations. And for example, here you have. Uh, you know, this, this plot deserves a, a, a separate talk, but the takeaway message is that you can take a quantum annealer and take advantage of the sampling capabilities of it to do Monte Carlo. Uh, if you can do Monte Carlo, you can try at least to attempt simulation on the quantum systems. And this is something that we did, but this simulation is not quantum, it's hybrid, right? So you can sample from a quantum annealer but then you have to somehow incorporate that the information that the quantum annealer gives you to do the calculation. So this is sort of hybrid algorithm. But, the, but at least this, this slide shows you that we are sort of on the path that we, we are starting to use quantum computers to do physical simulations. So uh, for today, uh, I would like to ask a very simple question. Uh, sorry, but can I ask, can I ask something yeah. about just the last point? Sure, sure, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so, so you mentioned that, okay, you used, uh, if I understood well, uh, D-Wave to, to do sampling which is necessary in some Monte Carlo simulations, right? So yes, yeah, are there, correct. Like, are there some promises, like, do people expect to actually get a quantum, like, to get a speed up here for this particular problem? Uh, um, I mean, quantum it's... speed up, yeah. So not really. So the technology is not there yet, and, and that's sort of obvious. And the, the algorithm that we, we use was sort of machine-based, right? So the idea was basically proof of concept to see if we can learn if this neural network. So, okay, so let me start by saying that you know neural networks, and those neural networks are abstract concepts. So you have a neural network, so you, you try to teach something to it and extract some useful information. But if you think about it, D-Wave is the neural network. So can we teach it something? And this experiment this was, was all about how can we teach it something? And we wanted to show if it works. It was not about the, the quantum advantage because we are, I, I believe personally that we are not on that path where we can start uh, tackling quantum advantage. It's, it's, it's too soon. As you can see from this simulation, this is very noisy. You can find the current ground states of the Ising Hamiltonian, which was the subject of this simulation, but you can do that with, with basically Monte Carlo and classical computers. So we, we are far away, at least from the context of this simulation, from any quantum advantage. Right? But I'm gonna, I'm gonna return to the quantum advantage point at the end of my talk. But this is a very good question. So, but for this experiment, not. And, but, but again, it was not the idea to, to provide any, 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 any advantage at all. But if you think about it, this is sort of amazing. You have a many body quantum system that consists of uh, 64 qubits strongly interacting with each other. And somehow you can find the ground state using, using quantum annealers. So it's quantum, I mean, so, so physics, so, so you, you have like a scenario that where physics is used to simulate physics. And this is, this is, this is what quantum computers are about. But, 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 but again, it's not, it was not done entirely on a quantum quantum computer. We needed to uh, assistance from a classical computer. This is why the, the algorithm is hybrid. But, but now I'm gonna ask if I can do something purely on a quantum computer, in, in particular something, so I would like to simulate processes, physical processes, and physical processes uh, involve time. And that's, 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 that's the tricky thing, to simulate something that has time dependence. And 
we would like to do that in parallel. So think about it. We have two separate moments of time and we're gonna simulate what's going on there parallel in time, in time, not in real space. So that's, that's the idea. And I'm gonna show you some experiments and the, the, the experiments are really simple. Uh, but the key point is everything that I'm gonna show you can be done on classical computers, can be. That's, there's no questions about it. But there is a key difference, which is the main result. We're gonna do this experiment. We did this experiment purely in parallel. This is something that a classical computer cannot do, period. Cannot do, right? You cannot do dynamics parallel in time, period. If you have classically, to compute wave function at some moment of t, you need to know the wave function before that. And that already sort of impose serialization. But quantum computers can do that differently. And this is, this is, uh, this, this talk is basically about that, right? So you can, you can ask, what's the, what's the simplest possible process you can, you can imagine? And I would argue it's, it's oscillation because oscillations are everywhere. So the simplest question we can ask, can we retrieve uh, oscillation from quantum computer? So can we uh, suggest a Hamiltonian that generates oscillation? And then can we ask a quantum computer to simulate that, right? Um, the key concept here is, and this is something that when I, when I actually uh, learned about that for the first time, it was sort of confusing, but also the great idea, because from a quantum mechanical point of view, uh, statical simulations like ground state properties and, and stuff are actually not that different from mm, dynamical simulations. Of course, there is price you have to pay. You have to enlarge the Hilbert space. But the very idea that you can conceptually think about those two different steps at the same page is amazing, at least if you ask me. And, th and we use that in, 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 in the paper. So that's the key, key concept here. And there's the uh, second side of this, because you, you know, we have quantum computers and the natural question is, well, do they work, right? So to answer that, you have to somehow benchmark them. So now the question is, how should you benchmark them? What kind of instances should you use? Should, should you use, right? So that's, that's those are the, the current open problems. And our idea was that, well, we want to simulate physics. And physics is very rich. Even if you have uh, like a single qubit or two qubits, you can generate very uh, rich dynamics, like entanglement, sudden death, uh, PT symmetric, uh, phase transition, stuff like that, right? So maybe we could use those rich physical processes to generate something which is hard for quantum computers. So the idea behind this, this, this research topic is sort of twofold, right? At, at the one point, you can investigate to what extent quantum computer can simulate physical processes. And on the other hand, if they cannot, you can at least provide hard instances, right, to test them. So from a scientific point of view, this is a win-win scenario. But either way, you're going to get something which is worth publishing. So basically. Uh, and before I, I showed you experiments and explain what they actually mean, let me just emphasize on something. And, and this is something that was also not that clear to me at, 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 at some point, right? Because usually when, when people ask why simulation on quantum systems or on classical computers are difficult, the, the sort of usual answer is, well, because the Hilbert space is sort of exponential, right? And this is true. But then you could, you could sort of counter this question saying, well, so let's add exponentially many resources, right? You can naively think of that. Even that would, possible, would be possible, then you still couldn't, wouldn't be able to simulate a physical system. And this is because something which is called Amdahl's law, basically. And Amdahl's law sets the upper limit for parallelization. So basically, even if you have an algorithm that can be parallelized in 95%, which means that 95% of your code in algorithm can run concurrently, then your uh, prospective speed up uh, from adding more and more computational power is gonna saturate. And this is why we will never be able to simulate classically, at least using von Neumann uh, architecture, quantum computers. So, and this is why we need classical quantum computers to simulate physics, right? So that's that's the key uh, motivation. Yeah, Michal. 
sorry, Bartek. Like, uh, like I, I'm, my camera is off because uh, the internet connection is not so sure. good. But okay, you, you made like a quite quite a provocative statement there. So I, I didn't catch this for this point really. So I mean, uh, so first of all, for sure, when you uh, when you have exponential resources, but in time, right? Also, then you can simulate uh, every quantum system. It seems to me, right? If you can, if you can invest huge resources in time. Oh, well, yes. Yeah, so, so, but this is sort of like cheating, right? Because if you have infinitely many time at your disposal, you can do everything. Mm -hmm. You can prove that p is equal to n p. You can, you can, you can do magic basically with infinitely many time resources. Uh, what I'm saying is that every classically. No, no, no. I'm every, not, I didn't say infinitely. I said exponential. But uh, fine. Oh, okay, Ex yeah. exp exp exponentially time. Oh. Yeah, uh, but 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 this the Amdahl's law is not about uh, uh, no, but it's like nitpicking. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. But but but. Uh, yes. Yeah, so this, just... this is. Uh, okay. So let me let me think about it because uh, here what I'm what I'm saying. Let, let me let me just try to understand what I actually said. Um, so when you have an algorithm, right? At some point, you need to exchange information between different parts of this of this algorithm, right? This is how it works. If something is non-trivial, you're gonna end up with the point where you have to exchange information. And basically, what I'm saying is that at some point, this is gonna be a bottleneck. That and this is exactly what prevents you from simulating efficiently, right? Because you can you can add exponentially many resources. Like here, for example, we are at more and more CUDA cores, right? Mm -hmm. You have 5,000 plus CUDA cores and your prospective speed up is 20, right? So this is ridiculous. This is really ridiculous. And, and this is universal law because classically, so basically there's only one way to break this law. You need to start from the very beginning in parallel, right? So, and as far as I know, only quantum computers can do that. Right? Natively, compute in parallel. And in this case, the, the Amdahl's law does not obey. Right? The, the, the nature does not obey Amdahl's law on, on, on quantum side, basically. Right? Is, is this, is this, is this uh, explained right? right? Do, do you understand what I'm saying here? So, and I'm not sure. So technically, even if you have in exponential time resources, if you, if, if you saturate, doesn't really matter, right? Because you're going to stay exponentially longer at some saturation point, right? So, Bartek, uh, sorry, I would, I would maybe like comment. I, I have maybe a few comments, but unfortunately, my internet connection is suboptimal uh, no. at the moment. So perhaps I postpone my questions to later time. But uh, okay, like as like it's. Okay, I, I just can, uh, so I basically to some extent, maybe I, I agree personally with this idea that you are trying to present, although in most of the instances, it seems to be like uh, not proven yet, as far as I understand, but I wanted to point out that there is some regime, some, some result, some recent, relatively recent result that somehow exploits it, right? So this is this, um, this work by uh, Robert Kenning, uh, Bravi, I believe, and some other people, which shows like uh, unconditional separation, like there are those works that show unconditional separation between quantum computers, like shallow depth quantum computers and uh, corresponding shallow depth uh, classical computers. So like, if, uh, in this regime, people actually manage to prove uh, like uh, super, like superiority of uh, uh, yeah of quantum computers. Oh, okay, so, 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 yeah, so just, just yeah. Okay, okay, so just just two comments. So first of all, I'm not familiar with the, with the result, but the second second more, more important comment is that you have to be very careful saying classical computers because we have different paradigms. This this law actually. Uh, 
is only valid for uh, von Neumann uh, architecture of, of, of computation, right? But you have different, like uh, neuro, neuro computing, you have MEM computing, some paradigms that try to explore how human breaks, uh, brain works, uh, so on and so forth. So when I say classical computing, I mean von Neumann paradigm. And this is, this is important. I'm not sure if this law actually works for, for different paradigms, right? So classical, yeah. not all yeah. classical computers. Bartek, so actually what I, I, I seen that what I was saying, at least that was my idea, I was supporting what, okay. what you were, you, I was not like opposing, okay? Okay, 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 okay. I was, okay, so, uh, uh, yes. Okay. So I don't want to interrupt any further because the connection is like, I will put the link in the chat for people that are interested. Like, please, I don't, okay. please go ahead. Like. I don't okay. Th yeah, okay. Thank you. So, so basically, takeaway message from this slide is that uh, there are two sides uh, for this uh, for inability to simulate classical uh, quantum system with classical computers. First is mathematical, right? The uh, ex the the dimension of the Hilbert space, and the second is uh, the the computational architecture itself. So this is something that I would like to remember. Right? So that that that's the takeaway message from from that side. Okay. So uh, let's begin with the actual results, which is the, 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 the experiment, okay? So, uh, like I said, we would like to simulate oscillations, so you can generate that easily. If you take a simple Hamiltonian, like, which is proportional to the Pauli matrix, like uh, sigma y, you know that if you calculate the state or expectation value or something which, is, which does not commute with the Hamiltonian, you're gonna get oscillation, right? This is quantum mechanics one-on-one, -on -one, right? Do you agree? Okay. Uh, sure. So, okay. So, so the question was, can a quantum computer uh, do that? So, uh, what you can see here uh, basically are two columns. Uh, one is uh, for one generation of quantum computers, and the second is for the newest generation of quantum computers. And those uh, histograms basically are just that, right? Histograms. So you run simulation. It doesn't matter. So, so the question is, how you get the instance? Uh, to run on a quantum computer and you know this is why I'm going to explain it later how we came up with the algorithm to generate an instance uh, such that it can be actually run on a quantum computer but suppose for a moment you, you have this right for some reason right you, you, you gather the instance right so you can you can uh, annul this instance right? using quantum annular you're going to get statistics right statistics like that and the first thing to, to see here is that the the lowest possible energy, which is the ground state energy, and for this, uh, for Wait, those like simulation, uh, yeah, I got, I got lost maybe. So, uh, right. So, do you what do you simulate? Do you want to simulate Rabi oscillations or yes, exactly, exactly that. that. Those those gonna be Rabi oscillations, right? But it doesn't really matter. So, uh, right, right. We, we gonna. But uh, but I just want to understand the setting, okay? So you want to understand evolution. So it seems I'm looking here. So it seems like you are looking on like evolution of a single qubit subject to this Hamiltonian, right? That's right. Uh, and initially the qubit uh, like I'm um, like is in the state zero. Yes. Or so, one, so for some, example, or one. one okay, right? it, it, it doesn't really matter, right? right? So this is just a single qubit, and then uh, how do you? Okay, you do something with this many qubit device. Uh, and you yes, what, uh, so, yeah. yeah. So, so this is something I'm gonna explain later. For now, I like you to focus on the actual results of the experiment because those are the most important things uh, of, of, of this talk. And don't worry, you, you're gonna, I'm gonna clear everything out, right? How the instance is created, but that's, but that's gonna be a technical part of the talk. But for now, I would like to focus on the actual results, right? So imagine, for example, that you have somehow encoded uh, this dynamics into an Ising instance, right? And you can annul this instance using an actual device. And the first row tells you basically what's the result, right? So you get, you get, you get some histogram, right? And you can see two, two things uh, uh, from this histogram. First is that the, the machine is really, really crappy, right? Uh, because from an ideal machine, you would expect the results sort of be centered around the, the ground state energy, right? Which in this case was minus 0.5 or something. It doesn't really matter, right? But the lower, the better here. And you can see clearly those, uh, those histograms are shifted to the left, which is bad, right? And you can see that you are getting uh, an energy 
an order of magnitude uh, higher than the ground state energy, which is that. But nonetheless, nonetheless, there are rare instances where you can actually hit the ground state. And for those instances, you get the correct result, which is the oscillation, right? Uh, the, as you can see, those, those uh, sinusoids here, uh, all the points uh, on the valleys and, and mountains here was actually computed correctly and parallel in time. So the, the quantum maneuver was able to find the ground state that corresponds to those points. Right? So you have, an, you have an algorithm that translate the dynamics into uh, the Ising instance, then you annul this instance, you get, well, the output uh, being zero and ones, and then you sort of uh, apply the inverse function to get the dynamics, right? So this is what we did. And it works, rarely, but it works. So basically, you have you can see those six uh, six points uh, on the simulation, right? Um, and there were uh, cases where the the quantum annular actually uh, found those perfect. So what it means is that it were uh, it was able to simulate the dynamics correctly, and this is the main result. Still, it's not a quantum supremacy because uh, this is a simple simulation. You can do that. By hand, basically, you calculate the oscillation of a single qubit. But the point is, this happens in parallel, and no one can do that. Right? Classical computers uh, or our brains supposedly cannot do that in, in fully, fully in parallel. So that's that's the main result. And again, the takeaway message from this slide is that the older generation generation wasn't able to find the ground state. We we tried many, many, many samples, many and many times and many configurations, we couldn't we couldn't make it work. So as you can see there, the uh, the technology is actually progressing very, very quickly, and this is very promising. But but again, uh, the newest generation the newest the, the previously newest generation, two thousand Q five called, uh, was able to find in rare cases the the uh, the, the oscillations, right? Okay, so do you have any questions uh, to oh. this uh, to the, to the results? I have some, but, have but, Philip, Philip, I see. but Philip, but Philip, uh, oh, Philip no, I, ask, I, I, ask, yeah, <laughs> I just uh, I don't think I got exactly what's going on in the sense of this parallelization. So do you implement this dynamics in all of the qubits in at the same time and? Uh, uh, or, or, or what's the parallelization here? This I didn't get, unfortunately. Uh, so, okay. so you're, you're gonna you're gonna see it shortly. Uh, okay. Speaking, but conceptually speaking, uh, mm -hmm. so if you have an Ising instance, right? The, the graph, the Ising Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. the, the adiabatic quantum computation is is a parallel computation mm -hmm. by, by 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 its very nature, right? You you process yes, information. Yes. Yes. Sure. Time, sure. Right. So if you can encode dynamics into that instance, you can easily say that you actually simulate uh, time properties of a physical system parallel in time, sort of, right? Okay, okay. So you like and uh, so you encode the uh, like single qubit dynamics into some instance that you can annul. Uh, yes. Yes, exactly. Uh, in the yes, in the right. instance that you can annul. Okay, yeah. okay, I get it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so if you if you have two. If you have two moments of time, classically, mm -hmm. to go from one point to the other, you'd need to do that serially, right? Because yeah, you uh, uh, right, of course. Right function before, but sure. here you, you compute. We compute all the time at the same time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think because you can. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Past, the future, and now are mixed. Okay, so but. Uh, but this is in the, in the sense that you like okay, so, but uh, the, uh, well, because you mapped somehow the uh, like time dynamics into something uh, which is uh, like uh, parallel in space or in other degrees of freedom in a sense, right? I mean, uh, yes, uh, you can phrase so, uh, it that way. Discret, yeah, we discretize uh, time. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm going to show you how the, 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 okay, the entire sure, process sure. Uh, works out, but 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 just uh, for now, I I I would like you to understand the the, the idea. That okay, sure. Some, cool. some some process, you encode it into Ising Hamiltonian, do you anneal it, 
and you go back. You sort of apply the mm -hmm. transformation to get the result. All right. And it happens in parallel. Okay. We have, we have yes. uh, well, a, a question. Okay. So actually, a few uh, questions were sort of related to, to mine, but then let me just continue. So my question, like, I, I got the idea that you, let's say, encode the, uh, the like, time evolution into, like, some bigger, uh, bigger, bigger let's say quantum machine then at the same yeah. time so to say you can access multi, multiple mm -hmm. uh time steps okay but the question <laughs> is my okay this is like can't you do it like just with classical machine something like this like by this encoding because you don't use one qubit to simulate many time instances right rather you uh, you you use many qubits to simulate uh, you know evolution of a single qubit Right, so the question yes, this is the, be, can you mm -hmm. use multiple classical systems to actually, you know, to, to do what you did? Yeah, that's a... Well, uh, well, okay, so first of all, you're absolutely right. Uh, this algorithm is extremely inefficient. We use 2040 qubits, static qubits, to simulate one single uh, dynamics, the dynamics of a single qubit. So in that respect, you're right. But can you, can you do it classically? Sure, you can but it wouldn't be in, truly in parallel, right? Because nothing classically is truly in parallel. You can emulate uh, parallelization, but it wouldn't be parallel. Uh, right? of, of course, what, what we are doing is extremely inefficient from a computational point of view, but as a proof of concept, it's a different, it's a different kind of computation we are doing, right? But you, can, you, can, you can do classical, you can do classical annually, right? You can do many things. You can, you can okay, solve it. Maybe, maybe we'll, let's postpone it to the discussion, but okay, please, I probably need to understand more details. Okay, okay, okay. so, so, um, so let me just uh, walk you through the, 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 the idea here. So first of all, of course, to, to retrieve the dynamics, you need to solve the Schrodinger equation. Naturally, it doesn't have to be a Schrodinger equation itself because the, the Hamiltonian does not have to be a Hermitian. So the, the idea works also for open quantum systems. Uh, because, as you know, you can actually encode, uh, you cannot, uh, Lillibland equation is sort of like a Schrodinger equation with something which is not Hermitian, right? Uh, so in principle, you can also include uh, the influence of, uh, from the environment, but that would be extremely difficult for the current platform, so we didn't do that. But, but in principle, you could. Uh, and of course, this, this, this equation uh, has a unique solution, uh, which can always be written down using time, uh, chronological time operator and the, the super exponent, right? But physically speaking, you can always decompose uh, evolution from T naught to T into a sequence of, of gates, right? And of course, uh, if I could get access to a real quantum computer that can realize gener generic quantum computation, you can directly apply those gates to so solve your problem. But we don't have a computers like that yet, experimentally accessible. Uh, so idea was to do, and this is why basically our algorithm is so, so inefficient because we are emulating quantum computation using uh, generic purpose quantum computation using specific purpose quantum computation, right? So this is like another level of emulation. We are not doing classical computers to simulate quantum computers. We are using not the generic quantum computers to sort of emulate generic quantum behavior, right? So it's always going to be inefficient, period, right? But that's not the point. Point is, can we even do it, right? Because five years ago, you couldn't even think about doing experiments like that because the machine was so noisy that you, you, you basically you would get like random output, right? Not as oscillation. So this is why the, 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 the result, result is, is, is interesting. So, okay, so how would you go about and try to encode that, uh, the sequence of unitary gates to, to be solved on quantum money? Okay, so that's, that's the question. And idea, basically the idea uh, is closely related to something that we called uh, Feynman's clock. So basically you can, you can write down a generic state. Um, you can superimpose pose all states at different moments of time. You can introduce something that counts time, right? Basic state that counts time, and you can always construct a state like this, right? And it was uh, by Kitaev or I don't know by someone 
working on something that was related to fame and that uh, that came up so someone came up with this idea of C operator and it's called clock op operator and basically what it does is that if you take this state and if you apply this operator to the state you're gonna get an eigenvalue uh, and it turns out that this operator is actually positively defined so this eigenvalue is actually the ground state so that's something that you can you can actually do with quantum maneuvers because quantum maneuvers are supposed to find the ground state, and now you have a time problem that can be cast into something that that needs to find the ground state. So that's the generic idea, okay? Uh, and of course, you have to somehow specify boundary or, or initial conditions. Uh, you can do that easily, just imposing extra constraint. And then you can simulate, you know, to solve Schrodinger equation, you need to initial condition. Uh, for your solution to be unique, you need to have those things: initial condition and, and smooth dynamics, right? And then you can you can you can simulate uh, everything basically unique. Okay. If you don't specify the initial or boundary condition, you get the family of solutions, and it's 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 it's, it's messy. This with, with, with our approach. Okay. So, but you can sort of work out the the magic, the mathematics. And it turns out that the, the whole problem boils down to solving a linear equations with, with the matrix, which is again positively defined and very sparse. Right? Uh, and that's something that you can represent as an optimization problem. Okay, because now I can define a, what does it mean to solve a linear system? You have to find x such that the a times x minus phi uh, is zero. So if you can find a minimum of, of, of such function, this minimum would at the same time be a solution to your linear problem. And by extension would be a solution to your initial problem, right? That is basically the time evolution. You have to, the only thing you have to do basically is just to count what is what, right? Which qubits uh, corresponds to which moments of time, right, basically. Right, because some some qubits in 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 your quantum maneuver setup corresponds to register that counts time basically that that's it but but again you can you can do some simplification because where when your system is hermitian you can define a simpler function right using a scalar product and obviously if you compute the first and second derivative you can convince yourself that the the x that minimizes that zero out this function is the actually the, the minimum right and this is something that almost almost quantum computers can do the only problem is that x uh involves uh, sorry about yeah. the q uh, okay you lo you lost me can you just move one, one side back sorry for so you okay so i understand this idea that you can encode the time evolution the ground state of, of some hamiltonian this i this i get and then sure. like Okay. Uh, and then, okay, you, you, you encode some like boundary and initial conditions, great. Uh, and then, okay, so what's the point? So, so, so this is effectively, as you said, like finding a ground state is a linear, uh, okay, is a just li linear problem, right? And then, okay, what, 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 what's happening now? Sorry. So, 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 well, so you have to solve a linear equation, right? Yeah, and this matrix L, uh, A basically contains all the information regarding the dynamics because it involves uh, unitary operators, uh, unitary gates, right? Mm -hmm. So, so the, the general idea is that if you have a generic purpose quantum computer, you can uh, apply those unitary gates directly to solve your problem, and you're done. Period. Then you can't, this mm -hmm. is you, yep. you're done, right? But if you don't have a generic purpose quantum computer, if you have a quantum annulars. You can uh, formulate a linear problem with a, uh, with a matrix, matrix that contains those unitary gates and somehow is related to your original problem. And then you cannot, you, you want to solve it with quantum computers, so you cannot do the, directly the inverse. But, but then the question is, what does it mean to solve a linear, a linear equation? Basically, it means that you have to find x such that uh, f of x is zero, right? Yep. But again, uh, if A is positively defined, you don't have to use the norm. You can use the scalar product like this. Okay. So 
to solve this linear uh, problem is to find x such that f of x is zero. Okay. Yeah. Is this is this uh, understandable? Okay. Okay. This. Okay. Maybe it's like okay. It's some technicality. I'm like a bit like. I'm just a bit. Oh, fine. Please. It's something uh, like. Mm. Oh, okay, so 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 if you can find so let let me just reformulate that differently. If you can find a minimum of f of x. Yep. So what would it mean? That would mean that the, the first derivative is zero, right? Or maybe sorry, I like maybe one thing like maybe you should you should have like f of x should a should have a squared or something like that or like because like when you no, write no, no. this norm. Uh, well, um, so 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 the f of x. Sorry, for the confusion, I'm actually using the same name for two different things. So let's for, forget about the the, the 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 equation involving the norm. Let's let's focus on the second one that involves yep. the uh, scalar product, right? So if you can find the minimum of this function, what this actually would mean? So first, it, it would mean that the the first derivative is zero, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because it's, yep. it's it's the min minimum, right? But if you take the second derivative of that, you get the linear equation, right? Which means that the the solution, uh, the minimum of this function gives you the solution of the linear equation. Now the question is if it's minimum or maximum, right? So to find out that, you need to compute the second derivative, and the second derivative is just a, and a is positive, mm -hmm. right? So it's definitely the the, the minimum. So that's the trick here. Okay. Right. Thanks. So, so, but you, you can you can you can use the g general equation involving the norm, but that would complicate things. And in fact, if you would go for uh, open quantum system dynamics, you'd need to go use the the general form, right? Uh, right. So, so okay. As far as I understand, simply the solution of uh, solution of the second problem is the same as the solution of the first of the first problem, but it's these are not the same uh, sort of. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Not the same function. Yes. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. so you can. You, yes. That's that's true. So if okay. you're uh, sorry for this. It's it's my. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just 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 ask. I'm. Those things are just sometimes messy, right? So if you don't understand something, just please please ask, and I will do my best to to explain it. Uh. So so again, just just to sum it up, right? So we have a function that resembles optimization problem, but not quite just yet. And if you have, if you can find a minimum of this function. It's gonna be automatically uh, the solution of the linear system that directly encode the dynamical behavior of the initial problem. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so what's the problem here? The problem is that your x involves uh, real numbers or complex in general, and and and, and that's an, that's an issue because qubits are well binary, right? So. But somehow you have to represent uh, real numbers, and this is this is the moment where our algorithm eats up all the qubits, because to represent real number you have mm -hmm. to expand it uh, in a basis. So this is why you need all those qubits. So to represent one, one uh, single number to R uh, precision points, you need R qubits. So this is why the algorithm is inefficient. But this is the best we can do at this point. And if you just plug this this x i sub i into the previous f function, you get a Kubo, right? Quadratic uh, unconstrained binary optimization problem, or if you will, the Eisenheim determinant. So this is how you go from the initial idea, initial Schrodinger equation into Kubo, right? Uh, and you can see another problem that that uh, pops up, and this graph that the scuba is defined is actually dense. So your problem basically is eating up all the qubits you have available because you have to use extra qubits to uh, to encode real numbers, and then you have to um, you have to somehow emulate dense graphs 
because quantum annulars are not densely connected. So you need to somehow mitigate that. I'm going to show you how, but, but this is why it costs you. This is this is exactly what 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 costs you, right? And if you would like to have complex numbers, you'd need to multiply this complexity by two, right? So uh, the and if you would like to add more qubits, you'd need to multiply the the number of qubits by by the number of qubits another two, right? So you go from thousand to two thousand to four thousand, right? And so basically that's that is this is what is responsible for the bad scanning we have. But but again, this is understandable because you cannot uh, you cannot expect anything else from, from this approach because again we are emulating general purpose quantum computation using specific purpose quantum computation and this is the price you have to pay period. Okay. Uh, so but this is Kubo, Isaac, right? And this is precisely what quantum computers solve, right? So the the idea behind the, the quantum maneuver is just that. You have objective function, which in this, uh, this case is a classicalizing model, which definition you can see. And, but the only problem is it's not, not every spin can talk to every, uh, any other spin. Uh, they, they are basically arranged into something which is called chimera graph. And you know, it, it is what it is, right? So they are densely connected but only locally and local parts are weakly connected with other local parts and the maximum qubits on that uh, infrastructure is 2048 right so we needed to use 2048 qubits to simulate six points time dynamics parallel in time so that's the overhead it's enormous but you know again it was it was it was to be expected so just for, for those of you who are not familiar with adiabatic quantum computer, I would like just, just to say how it works. So how can we do the magic? Right? Because here everything is classical. There's no quantum at all. Everything commutes. Those S, I, S, J are just classical spin variables, right? Plus and minus one. There's no quantum. So quantum, quantum came, uh, quantum came uh, next. So basically, you know that, um, there's this famous adiabatic theorem. Uh, it's, it's valid for both classical and quantum systems. Uh, and basically, the idea is like this: uh, if you have a system, you can drive it, right? Applying external magnetic field or whatever, you can drive it. Drive it, which means you're gonna be changing it. But then, if you if you do it slowly, whatever it means, you're gonna always create a time for a system to adjust. So the the ideal scenario is that. If you start from the ground state, and if you're going to drive the system very slowly, the ground state is going to follow the Hamiltonian, right? So at the end, you're going to end up with the ground state. But now the trick is that at the beginning, you have a very simple Hamiltonian, right? The schedule here, at the beginning, the delta function is, is zero. Your Hamiltonian is, prop is proportional to the x component, right? So you have a situation where all spins are pointing in the x direction. Nothing happens, very simple, very easy to prepare experimentally. And right? so, so, so that's it. But then you switch on the interaction, right? So your delta is, is becoming uh, less negligible and, and it increases as you, as you do computation. But at the same time, your, your G function is decreasing, right? So at the end, you end up with the, with the Ising Hamilton, right? And now, uh, the adiabatic theorem tells you that if you do it very slowly, your state is going to be the ground state of this final Hamiltonian, which means it's going to be the ground state of the Ising Hamiltonian, right? Is that is this understandable? Okay, yeah, so, yeah. So, so, so basically, that's that, that's the idea. That, that's the whole computation. And at the beginning, you have something which is classical, let's say. I know it's 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 on a x direction, but it doesn't really matter. You can always rotate it, right? So at the at the beginning it's classical, at the end it's classical, but in between it's quantum, right? If you do the computation, the annealing, you you're doing computation, and everything talks to everything else, and computation happens in parallel. So that's that's the non-trivial moment of 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 this of this machine, right? Uh, so this is this is this gives me the right to say that I'm computing parallel in time, really in parallel, because the, this is what the annular does. Uh, 
so again, just uh, on the technical side, everything costs you. And basically, to to be able to pull the simulation, you need to a complete graph of order R R L T, where T is the number of qubits uh, time po uh, time points you want to simulate uh, concurrently. The L is the uh, the the number of the, the, the corresponding Hilbert uh, dimension of the Hilbert space, and R is the the required precision you 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 want to have. And again, if you have complex numbers, you have to double it, right? Double it by this uh, isomorphism, right? And uh, to give you a flavor of what's what is possible, what was possible with the previous generation, uh, we have a new generation that we haven't tried yet. But uh, with previous generation, we could, for example, uh, to simulate six points using two bits of precision, for example, using something which is called embedding, right? So we needed to use many qubits to many physical qubits to represent one uh, single logical qubit. This is this is called embedding, right? To mitigate the lack of connection between qubits, right? So all those those, those are technical uh, technical aspect that I, I hope explain why the algorithm scales uh, so bad. Uh, so just let me go back and summarize that, right? Hopefully. Uh, it's going to be more clear uh, after you saw uh, how the algorithm works. So you have a, a process. It doesn't have to be quantum, right? But it has to be governed by the schrodinger like equation. Or, and you can transform this process into the, the, the Schrodinger equation into the Ising Hamilton. And you can anneal it. And you can apply the, uh, the inverse function to retrieve the data, right? So the, the, this is extremely simple, simple algorithm. It scales badly, but uh, it does something that nothing, nothing else uh, does, right? Computes things in parallel. So that's the that's the scientific value of the, behind this paper, right? Proof of concept that something can be done with the uh, already very noisy uh, current generation of quantum quantum annulars. Um, so, but that's not quantum. We wouldn't, this wouldn't be a quantum supremacy in any means. Partially because there is an efficient algorithm to represent quantum processor, a chimera graph, using tensor networks, and you can sort of this is very, this is this is this is interesting because it goes to the parallelization. So with tensor networks uh, allows you to store uh, all possible co combination in a very clever way, and you can contract uh, uh, such tensor networks to get the low energy state. Right. So this is uh, this is why uh, this is why Chimera will not be able to uh, achieve a quantum supremacy at all because it's simulable uh, with classical tensor networks. And we, of course, we uh, uh, that was the, actually one of the uh, of the tests for our algorithm. Uh, we uh, we thought that instances we generated uh, would be hard for for classical computers and easy for for quantum computers because you know entanglement and stuff but it didn't turn out that way we, we, we were able to simulate it classically and very the quantum right so that's it right basically um, so but now two days ago as I mentioned that uh, D wave announced that and the, the newest the newest system it's called Pegasus and it's it's more powerful a lot a lot more powerful it has an order of magnitude more connections you can do, for example, for the chimera graph, you could always you could only only do uh, k65. Now you can do uh, k190. Right? You could simulate many qubits, uh, and you could simulate non-trivial dynamics. And this is actually our plan for for the short uh, for the near-term future, right? So first of all, we're gonna benchmark the new machine using our instance and see what happens, right? Because, because again, I mean. If someone tells you that well, this new generation is 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 good, right? What does it mean, right? The, the real question is, we couldn't simulate, or we could simulate barely physics on it. Can we simulate it a bit more? And we can. We now we we know how to quantify it, right? And something we can do more is that we could actually simulate like sudden delta of entanglement, or entanglement itself, or PT symmetric slowing down of decoherence, or PT symmetric. Uh, uh, Phase transition. We can do multiple qubits, 
and see what happens, right? Because this is an untrivial question. Can a current generation of quantum annular uh, capture entanglement, for example, right? So is the physical device good enough to capture non-trivial physics? So that's, that would be the, the underlying question here. And this is basically our uh, short uh, term goal. Uh, well, that I think that this is uh, everything I prepared for you for today. If you have questions, just don't hesitate to ask them. Uh, thank you, Bartek, for thank a you. very nice yeah. uh, talk. Uh, yes, now uh, we have time for questions, comments to the speaker. Yeah. Right, so uh, could you say a little bit more about the neural networks from two years ago that simulate chimera graph? Uh, like uh, this, this slide, yeah, because this is like uh, it, it, it sounds like a strong statement, right? Uh, like, so this, uh, 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 can you elaborate on what that means exactly? <laughs> like what they do and what are the consequences uh, for the uh, the D-wave, let's say? Yeah, so I, will, I wouldn't argue that this is a, a strong statement. Uh, the only thing we, we showed was that uh, for the current the previous uh, generation, uh, Chimera 2000 and Q, we were able to, to simulate it entirely, basically. There wasn't any problem for classical computers, right? So basically, uh, I, I, I mean, you know how it is with heuristics, right? You can always find a sort of pathological instance where you're gonna stack, right? Basically, right? you, you can, the only mm -hmm. thing you have to do is understand how the heuristic works, and then you can come cook up something which is like a, very exotic and your algorithm is going to fail, right? So, yeah, it happens, right? We, 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 we saw some instances like that, but for the majority of the problems, and, and again, for me, an interesting problem is something that comes from physics, right? I want to simulate physical systems. So, and every instance that somehow gives me that is interesting. And, and the only concern for me is if you can simulate that, right? And if we could. And I agree with you. This is, we're not proving any, you know, our algorithm, the tensor network based algorithm, uh, has limitations. And I'm pretty sure you could find other pathological instances and we would be stuck, right? But the idea here is very simple. Uh, basically, the chimera graph uh, is very regular, right? So you have those unit cells that are weakly connected. So you can, you can something, you know, for tensor networks, what is difficult to simulate are multi-connections. But then if you, if you can, you, if you could then take a tensor and represent the entire unit cell, you, you wouldn't have to worry about those connections. You'd have to only emulate a weakly connected clusters. And that's the, basically the, yeah. the whole idea be behind it, right? So the same thing that uh, limits the D-wave, which is the manufacturing process, they cannot, they, they couldn't, these two, until two days ago, manufacture more dense graph. Mm. Uh, the, the, same, the, the same process allows us to actually tackle this problem. Right? And they knew, right. it, they knew it. We actually had a multiple discussion with D-Wave and then they, they, they were actually uh, familiar with the, with the problem. This is, this, is, this is why they've been working on the new generation. They, they knew that was the problem. And now actually, we, right now we are working on the, I, I think personally, that we can use some clever tricks and then try to attack the, the, the new generation. Right. And then we'll see if it works or not, right? So that's the that is sort of a the, the, the plan for for a year or two years. So first of all, we would like to attack the problem from two different sides. So we'd like to simulate physics with the new generation, but at the same time, we'd like to see to what point the the, the newest generation can be simulated classically. Right? Sure, sure, yeah. So I, I, I'm not sure what kind of, uh, I, I can go into details uh, concerning those tensor networks, but uh, I, I'm not sure uh, to what extent you are guys familiar with uh, DMRG methods and, and, and uh, tensor contractions and stuff, because at some point it gets, gets really messy and, and, and actually it, it's a board and pencil is needed to, to actually start okay. explaining stuff. So I unfortunately haven't uh, yet learned this, but I plan to. So at some point, maybe until December when you come, then I will be prepared for this discussion. Yeah, it's on our plate actually to learn. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if you if you guys have uh, you know like uh, tables in Warsaw, we can, <laughs> we can we can we can do lots of things. Yeah, yeah we, we do have yes. So, uh, more questions, comments to, to Biotech. 
Right. So I have another question, uh, like more directly related to the whole talk. Um, so like this is a maybe philosophical uh, a little bit, but uh, because you are, uh, are very excited in a sense uh, that this, uh, this what uh, what this quantum engineer does is a uh, like true parallelization of computations. Uh, and since I'm not like uh, too familiar with computer science, so could you uh, explain a little bit to me, like what is not real in a sense in a classical parallelization, like I use multi cores in Intel or whatever, right? Uh, like, or maybe uh, uh, just uh, this is, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, or... so, 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 so let me, let me just, just try to understand if I actually, uh, uh, okay, so, so the question was, uh, what's no, the classical parallelization? Yeah, so the question would be like, Michal also pointed out, in principle, I can do the same encoding as you did, like, because, well, you do this encoding classically anyway, and then I could run that on, in parallel on, uh, you know, classical processors, right? Um, yeah. And uh, maybe yeah. the, mm -hmm. what, what is uh, somehow the, uh, what is the difference in the, like, wh what is uh, yeah. okay, uh, okay, with okay, the parallelization? How, how did, oh, okay, so, so, so the question is how do two, uh, how do two methods compare actually? Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, that's what oh, okay. I mean. So, so, yes. So, so suppose you have the, the Isaac Hamilton, right? So the, the first question is how would you solve it, right? So the, 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 the simplest possible method would be with Monte Carlo, right? Mm -hmm. But then you, you, you have to, well, you could, you could use many processes, like you have an Intel processors with 16 or 16, even, even 32 cores, right? So you can mm -hmm. basically assign, you can, you can assign a different task to a different processor, right? To do something, some part of computation, but mm -hmm. at some point, you'd need to, for them to communicate. Sure. Mm -hmm. So it has to be serial. You have to mm -hmm. put mm -hmm. a barrier. And, 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 and so one process would have to stop and start talking to other processes and say, well, I have this piece of data. So give me the, another piece of data. I'm going to match them and we're going to continue together again. Right? So right. that gives you this, that gives you this bottleneck. And of course, mm -hmm. if you want to simulate one single qubit, it doesn't really matter because the 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 simul the, the no. simulation would be that mm -hmm. fast. You wouldn't even you wouldn't even see this bottle. No, sure, sure. I, I mm -hmm. Yeah, but in in principle, it's there. Okay, so in other words, so that uh, that uh, uh, parallelization in quantum devices, this is the part where where entanglement is like uh, this is due to the entanglement, uh, like yes. in a, right. So, this is just yeah. the this, uh, reality part, which. <laughs> Uh, which is, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and yeah. in the uh, this is, this is, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay, this okay, is, uh, the, the, the entanglement is responsible for, for computational power of, of, of quantum computing, but there's something which is even more awesome is that you cannot actually run a serial problem program on, on a quantum computer, it's 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 parallel by its very nature, right? Right, yes, exactly. Okay, to, okay. Mm -hmm. so if you, if you have a one processor that has two cores, for example. A core, mm -hmm. common setup, you can idle one core and assign everything else to to the first core, right? You can do that easily. You can idle a core. You don't have to assign it any work, and it's gonna work, right? But yeah. for quantum, if you have a, you can of course disable qubits, like connection between them. But once you have connections between them, they cannot be idle. They 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 don't, they're gonna evolve anyway. Because mm -hmm. the Hamiltonian, if the qubit is in the Hamiltonian, they're going to evolve. So they're going to change. They're going to do computation. It's going to do computation, right? So in quantum, you have, and this is, this is why, I, I, I think this is why uh, programming quantum computers is so, so difficult. Because we are not, we're not getting used to idea of thinking in parallel. We, we, everyone thinks in serial, right? So the usual uh, approach to, to, to write code is, well, let's figure out an algorithm and then let's try to parallelize it. So this is how it works. And then you're gonna end up with, with Amdahl's law that, that tells you that you, you're not gonna go anywhere from, from, from a point, right? But for quantum computers, writing an efficient algorithm is difficult. You have to start thinking in parallel from the very beginning. There is now so, such a thing as, yeah. Sorry, but can I just, because, okay.
Okay, I, can I have a comment to one of the things that you just said? So I, I guess, I mean, there is a difference if you have like mod, like quantum Turing machine or just standard circuit model, then you actually on the on paper, of course, and or in reality, if you assume fault tolerant quantum computer, then you can put those qubits in idle, like you can turn off gates, right? That, then you can. In reality, you can like you cannot if you don't have the, like such a like fine control. So like, uh, right? So, well, so the, like, like so because you like can, if we believe mm -hmm. in faults, like if we let's say if one accepts that eventually those fault tolerant computers will be available, then it's post like then in, in principle we are just realizing the the gate model of quantum computing, right? So, so uh, uh, yeah, okay, okay. You can, you, you could, you could, in principle, idle some qubits. Exactly, uh, exactly. But then, but, but then, if you idle them, why do you, why do you need them in the first place? Because from uh, the classical point of view, it's, it's understandable. At some point, you you start doing parallel processing, and then you cannot do it anymore. So one qubit has to do the, the all the work, like gather all the information, and ev everyone else is waiting. So you you have. Uh, actively participating workers that cannot do any work. And you cannot, as far as I know, you cannot have such a scenario in quantum reality. Okay, um, so I, I guess like at some point of the competition, you might wa not want to use qubits. But okay, let me add one more stone to like, cause you said, okay, you do uh, like, there is no real pa parallelism when, when classical machine user like solves, let's say Eisen Hamiltonian. But then, uh, well, uh, you could uh, say that if you do this annealing, then you have actually some, you know, you don't use gate, like gates at model of computation, but effectively you have some information transfer or you, you have, you know, it, it depends how you like, in, in my opinion, somehow depends if you, what you want to call what, because you have some like dynamics there, right? When you do the annealing. Okay, and it's uh, yes, okay. You, you, the whole system defi defi evolves. Yeah, definitely, right. but it, but but it evolves as a whole. Okay, okay. So, so, so that's that's yeah, I, yeah. I, so, right, so, so again, right. I could I could I could I could disable some qubits even even uh, on quantum annulars, just put, putting some couplers to zero, right? But but then mm -hmm. those qubits would not participate in the evolution, right? So this is sort of cheating in that sense. So I, and what I'm saying is is that. In classical computers, at some point, you end up with a situation where you have to, some processes have to wait because only single process can do some computation. So mm -hmm. they have to wait. It's not that they, they wait because some other part of the algorithm requires them to wait. They have to wait. But in classical, mm -hmm. uh, classical algorithm, of course, if you design an algorithm, a situation like this, you can always, or maybe they, that's the, more clear statement that you can always avoid a situation like that. You can make a situation probably like that, but you can always avoid it. So that's that's that, that's the point. Okay. 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 Are there uh, thanks, by the uh, thanks, uh, by the, Are there any more comments or questions to to the speaker? I have one more, but I don't want to. <laughs> okay. So this is like a concrete technical question. So can you go back to this? moment when you were like going from this optimization problem to the Kubo problem because it seemed to me that it was like exactly like just this transition like with this uh, floating numbers and stuff that sounded to me like okay like quite hard like that you uh, like you use again like uh, can, can you because it, it seems to me that there should be maybe some but like some more clever way, okay, not clever, more efficient way to to get those numbers. I don't know, but maybe by measuring, uh, like, not just beads, by I know, uh, by you know, if your Hamiltonian, for example, what if your Hamiltonian was not just classical, right? Maybe mm -hmm. you could have just coherence, like some coherences there, and then, okay, maybe you need to measure. Mm. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you cannot measure it in a single basis, but you know, effectively, you can you can sample those things. Uh, and, uh, yeah. 
so, so there's lots of things to unpack here. So first of all, you're absolutely right. Right. There has to be a better way to do all of things, all of these things, because first of all, uh, usually you would not be interesting in, in outputting the entire, you know, history state. Usually what you're interesting is in the average value of, of some observable, and that should be uh, encodable using less qubits. So that, that's for sure. You know, the question how to do it is an open problem, but, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's an open problem. But the second thing is that, and this is something which is very important that you mentioned. If the Ising Hamiltonian were not classical, then everything would be would be so much difficult because of one thing. So note that at the end of the computation, a D wave does computation, you have to measure stuff at the end, like like normally you would. Mm -hmm. But the order at which you measure doesn't matter because everything commutes. The moment you start having something which is which not, that does not commute with the the originalizing Hamiltonian, well, you, you you automatically have to solve a problem of of the order, and no one knows how to do it. Okay? So that's that, that's the issue. And again, interesting thing is that you could ask why D wave is not a generic purpose quantum computer. And the simplest short answer would be and this is a paper from two thousand seven by Benonta that one crucial interaction in one uh, orthogonal di direction is, is needed. So if you could manufacture that, you could automatically have universal purpose quantum computers. And this is why, the, 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 but, but then you have to measure things at the end and it's, it's, it's getting difficult. Okay? So your question basically are related to to this question, why this is not generic purpose quantum computer? Right? But but then if we, if we had right. a generic purpose quantum computer, right, we wouldn't need a quantum manure, then we would realize those gates on, directly. Sure. Right. Ju just quick comment. Okay, I, I had a privilege, you know, to have like, okay, to, to have Wikipedia or internet when you were giving a guess, like those 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 those, those fam payment states, right? Uh, yeah, Feynman, Hamiltonian, so to say, Feynman, well, they're yeah. kind of used to, to. Okay, it's like it's related to what you just said. I think it's like something a ground state of a local Hamiltonian is a like a. Yeah. Uh, it's a Q. Uh, it's okay. It's a QMA complete or QMA hard problem. So something even harder than BQP. Okay. So uh, yeah. So it, it relates like to. Okay, like. If you could like find, if you could find, uh, if you could uh, find uh, ground states of those more complicated Hamiltonians, non-commuting ones, then that that's uh, uh, that's too powerful in some sense. Yeah. So 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 so, so first of all, I'm, I'm not very good with those complexity classes, but you're probably yeah. right. Uh, but this, this this idea behind the history of state, the operator yeah. that corresponds to the history of state. Uh, you know that adiabatic quantum computation uh, is equivalent to generic quantum computation, assuming you can yeah. realize those extra gates. And th this, this basically, this idea behind clock is used to prove it. Right. So I, I'm not sure if you if you uh, ever uh, went through the, the the proof of that, but at some point there is this clock involved. So this is what we did, right? We 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 actually realized the proof of the adiabatic quantum computation experimentally, just cutting everything that we cannot experimentally realize, and we uh, mm -hmm. ended up with something which is experimentally realizable. So basically, you can, you can look at our uh, simulation as a manifestation of this equivalence proof. Thanks. So any more questions to, to the speaker? Many thanks for joining us. It was a great seminar. I'm 